This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Michael Schrage, who is uh, a research fellow at MIT, Sloan School of Business, and also uh, the author of a number of uh, fantastic books, most recently this one, uh, Recommendation Engines. Um, and by the way, I have to confess that um, when I saw this book, you know, it's part of this series usually think of them as just kind of these review pieces, but this one actually turned out to be a really, uh, a really interesting, <laughs> and, and it went in very unexpected directions as we'll see. Um, but also the author of, uh, this book, um, this is a seminal book, the innovators, uh, hypothesis, uh, which goes back, I think to 2014, also the mm -hmm. author of a book called serious play, how the world's best companies simulate to innovate. And what do you want your customers? Who do you want? Who do you want your customers to become? Who do you want your customers to become? Uh, Michael, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, simultaneously trip down memory lane, but also look at the, into the future a bit. Well, yeah. And this book right here. Okay. So I, the reason why I said this went in unexpected directions is that you, um, you went into kind of a, a history of the advisory business, right? You talk a little bit about, you know, where do people go to find out, right? What to buy, what to do, where to go. It's even who to, you know, marry and mate with. And, um, right. you know, this has changed a lot since the early days. So you started off with a discussion of what you called, uh, uh, divine tech or <laughs> divin tech, right? right? Which, Which is about, tech. yeah. Going back to the, to the oracles, the original oracles of Delphi yes. and so forth. And you walk through yes. a history of astrology and, and, and what I found interesting is, you know, I've, I've talked to a bunch of people about the history of statistics and we, 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 most of us believe that statistics has its origins in, um, you know, gambling. Right. And, uh, and then you talk about this whole other history that, that came out of, um, astrology and you talk about this guy Cardona and how he's right. kind of like the forgotten founding father of statistics. Cause he went off in this astrological direction. So, so what, you know, was that, I'm sure the editors of this book did not tell you to, you know, do a history of <laughs> advice. Well, you know, it, I, I'm glad that you, you, you began there because, you know, yes, I did have fun with the Divintech thing. And one thing was playing the gods versus playing the odds mm -hmm. as a, as a paradigm shift. And I was interested in the Oracle of Delphi because of course the Oracle of Delphi wasn't just about, you know, giving you prophecies. Um, the Oracle of Delphi, what was up there on the column? Know thyself, you know? So there was a relationship between predicting the future and understanding yourself in the present and who you might want to become. Um, and I wasn't, there's a whole interesting cast of characters. The one Philip I should add to this is that chapter sort of on the history of advice, the history of recommendation. And, you know, we, 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 we just as a little bit of a side digression, you know, Aesop would tell fables that, you know, were advisory fables. And you know how Aesop met his end? He was heckling the crowds at the, the temple of Delphi. And so they threw him over a cliff. So the idea that, oh my gosh, we get to have this, this uh, mashup literally of Aesop and the Oracle of Delphi, that was too good to miss. But I tell you what, when I wrote that paragraph of oh, that chapter, the, my editor loved it, but when we submitted it to the peer reviewers, they all said, take that chapter out because what does that have to do with recommendation engines? And that's why, if you'll forgive the illusion of continuity, I love that you introduced this book as part of the essential knowledge series, because my view is it's essential that you understand the historical roots and antecedents that lead to a, a, of certain fundamentals that transcend human behavior. Because as much as we have the Oracle of Delphi in the West, we have the I Ching in the East. We have astrology in Asia and China. We have astrology in, in the West. The whole notion of looking to the stars for advice, looking to the gods for advice, looking for dice for advice, this transcends time and culture. And, you know, just to, again, slightly digress, you, you focused in on the astrology side, but, but 
look at where the phrase lunatic comes from. Astrology and astronomy were literally algorithmically entwined. That was one of the things about Cardano. Cardano was not just an astrologer, he was an astronomer. There was math associated with these things. There were altogether now algorithms. So your horoscope, what's, what's a horoscope? It's, it's a recommendation based on mathematical calculations, algorithms based on where the time you were born and you know, where the planets are aligned when you have a certain decision to make at a certain time. So these things that seem disparate actually have a core fundamental organizing transcendent principle and recommendation engines are just, you know, they're, they're about the past, present, and future of advice. They're the past, present, and future of self-discovery. And that's, I find that fascinating. Well, I think a lot of people talk about, um, there are these big discontinuities, right? So, uh, you know, there's books out there called, you know, the death of expertise and the, you know, the death of, um, Mount you know, wisdom, yes. and, you know, and how we've moved from getting our advice from these experts to getting advice from more automated, uh, engines. But, you know, the, the, the continuity piece is that those experts they were doing pattern recognition, right? They were looking at, uh, data. They were looking now, maybe the, the signs and signals may have been, you know, the, the, the stars and, and, and so forth, rather than, you know, patterns of, uh, purchasing or patterns of, of browsing. But, but, you know, th those, the, the, we haven't moved from, you know, expertise to, to, to sort of, you know, peer advice. Um, we, we that's not, there is a discontinuity, but but there's this continuity, uh, involving pattern recognition that, uh, expert, I, I, I and you said, you mentioned the data, the divin, divin, diviners were the data scientists of their day. Yes. Yes, they were. And, and, uh, I, but I just want to double down or actually un, un, unpack some of the things that you're saying. The underlying notion of what is a pattern and who gets to see the pattern, who gets to interpret the pattern. Is it a pattern that has meaning? Okay. How is that meaning made relevant to you? So let's do a, you know, when, when you go to the Oracle of Delphi, you're getting a bespoke recommendation. Um, interestingly there, the patterns come from the, the, the Oracle being seized by the God. So they get they're they're informed by a deity in that regard. Whereas, whereas, um, other, other diviners would look at the entrails of goats and oxen and sheep and assorted cattle for this. And you'd see patterns in this. You'd see in China, looking at the, the patterns on the backs of tortoises. So the, the notion I, of I love how patterns, you said that the, the tortoises had a really good UX. Yes. The tortoise, great UX, you know, ab ab absolutely. Thank you for picking up on that. But, but notice what you've done here. You've identified the unit of analysis as the pattern. Now, the question then becomes, who gets to A, call it a pattern, B, determine the meaning of a pattern, and then back to the tortoise, the UX. What's the user experience of translating that meaning to the individual seeking advice? I'm fascinated by that. You've pointed it out as a discontinuity between human interpreters as a pun intended medium for pattern recognition and interpretation, but why not a machine? Why not a machine on, on this? So, so the automation of advice, you know, is it, it's following as automation becomes smarter and smarter and learns to learn neural nets, et cetera. I don't, where you, what you describe as a discontinuity as a disconnect, I see the, a natural evolution on, on this. So, so yes, we have, we have human beings identifying and interpreting patterns. And now we have human beings and machines and then machines by themselves interpreting these patterns. But I don't see that as any kind of discontinuity at all. Why? Because what matters is the pattern. What matters are the data, the way the data organizes into a pattern. What matters is how do we extract signal from noise from that pattern? 
And then how do we con convert that signal into an interface, into an experience that makes that advice, that makes that recommendation, that, that makes that pattern uh, uh, more useful and usable for that individual or for that family. It's as relevant for Netflix and TikTok as it was for, for the Oracle of Delphi and court astrologers. Well, now I think that, um, the, what we call recommendation engines now, when we think about Amazon, Netflix, YouTube, TikTok, and so forth, they're, they're really prediction engines, right? So they're, they're predicting, right. you know, what you are going to like, what you are right. going to click on. Right. And, and so do, I mean, that's a little bit different from kind of telling you, you know, what you should do or what you should like. Right. Um, um and, and so it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's more positive than normative. Right. And I think, so that's what some people have, you, a, have a problem with that. You've put your finger on it because, th and this was, please, I'm, I'm so gra grateful that we don't have an audience, uh, live on, on this because people would hiss by what I'm about to, at what I'm about to say, but there's a, this. I had an insight that really represented, yes, apologies to Tom Kuhn, a paradigm shift for me. You know, I have a background in computer science and economics and, you know, really you study in school and what are you looking for? You're looking for the right answer, the best answer. And what sucked me in to recommender systems, to recommendation engines, and the way that they were designed, the way they were architected, the way they were experienced was instead of getting the best answer, I'm getting the best choices. And to me, the real shock is if you're just getting the best answer, then the issue is you need to comply with the best answer. The destiny is you're a meat puppet because that's the answer. That's what you should do. You become you know, historical analogy, you become a slave to the algorithm, but it's not a compliance engine. It's a recommendation engine. If you give me the best choices, I retain agency. I can decide that this choice is better for me at this time than that choice. And that notion of a architecture, a pattern interpretation architecture, that improves and expands my agency that says, well, people like you make these sorts of choices, but I get to choose how much I want to be like that. Something that empowers agency. Gosh, I find that really appealing as opposed to saying, well, this algorithm says this is the best answer. That's what you should do. And if you don't do it, you're bad. You're bad because you're not doing the normative thing. And, you know, given your own background in data science, this has got to be a, a huge issue because sometimes you have clients, sometimes you have people who should, should, should just give me the answer. When in fact, in reality, you're a better professional, a better partner, a better advisor, if you give them the best choices, that's not a subtle distinction. In fact, it's the, it's almost, forgive the use of your word. It's a discontinuity from a, a lot of advice in the past, which is the reason why I'm going to you is I want to know the future. This is about a future that you get to choose. Sorry for being long winded, but this is really one of those huge discriminators for me. Well, let's, let's get back into sort of the origins of, of the modern recommendation engines. You, right. you, you walk through, you know, the tapestry and, and Ringo right. and, and some of these You're early, and it's kind of hard to realize it's, 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 you have to remind yourself that this was not that long ago, right? When no. these things were first cooked up and some of them no. happened in MIT, some of them happened at, at, at Xerox, but they, they were originally designed to kind of help uh, researchers wade through all of the information that was kind of, you know, coming through the pipeline. You've got all these academic articles, you've got all this research and, you know, there's no way that you can possibly keep up with it. And so you need, uh, someone or something to kind of, you know, wade through and, and, and figure out, you know, what to prioritize, right? But you're, you're, you're leaving out a, a, a huge, dare I say, trillion dollar alternate of that. You're exactly right. Information overload in research, relevance in research, 
was the driver for the earliest ones. We can talk about the consumer market, you know, later on in the conversation. But, and so what kind of quote unquote filters should you develop to support people as they seek to research? But it's the second syllable. Don't forget, we had what? Google, Yahoo, Alta Vista. The other, again, apologies to Kuhn fans, paradigm was search. Search and recommendation are not the same thing. The, the, yes, the filters, the underlying filter aspect may be, may be similar, but the notion of doing a search, a keyword search is very, very different. I mean, it may well be that if you sit down in front of Google or Google Scholar and begin doing keyword search, you will get interesting recommendations. But, but if you're looking for something, <clears throat> and again, you're running an interdisciplinary podcast here. If you're looking for unusual angles of interdisciplinary perspective, then you're going to ask somebody maybe like you or compliment you to, to offer up a recommendation on this. And so the whole notion, the architecture of search, the digital architecture of search, in fact, in reality is not the same. The pattern formation is not the same. The pattern wait, wait, but when you, when you run a search, right, um, you know, there's, there's a almost infinite number of, um, results that, um, satisfy the criteria of the search. And so, you know, when they provide you with an order or a sequence that is in itself a, a recommendation, right? These are the articles that we think you ought to check out first, right? Well, you see, that's where we run into both semantic and ontological issues because I don't, I do not, I came away from my book. I came away from my pun intended research, believing that in fact, <clears throat> recommendation is not the same as search. Algorithmically, it's not even the same as, as search. You get a list, but the, the patterns underlying a list from a Google search is different than the patterns underlying the list from a Netflix recommendation. So and when so way, Netflix provides you with a list of recommendations, isn't that just a response to the query, you know, what should I, what should I watch next? Right? Well, that depends what, what, on how, what am I most likely to, to be interested in next? So, well, that you're, you're just, you know, waving a red flag in front of me, aren't you? You're trying to provoke a response in the book. There was a very interesting, you know, I talk about the, the, the notion of that it, the search, pun intended, the search for advice is one of these things that transcend history, culture, et cetera. But I'll tell you a phrase that I came across from, you know, JD systems, from Netflix, from TikTok, from their data science communities. All of these people were involved, you know, they're the Rexis, that's the academic conference, global conference, you know, looking at recommender systems research, which <clears throat> by the way, is not a quote search engine conference, let's put that off to the side, but they all, these different groups all sort of came to the same formulation and same language. They all as, as a destiny for their design. We want to know you better than you know yourself. Okay. That's not, okay. That's not what search is about. Search is, you know, Needle, we'll find any needle in any haystack. That's what search is. We know you better than you know you yourself. We know what you want even before you know it. Forgive me. Those are fundamentally different organizing principles. And, and let me double down on the, on this, because one of the exchanges I got, to, you know, I, I, the Netflix people were very nice. Everybody I spoke with was, was very, very nice to me. Uh, I, and I should say not just nice, open. Um, <clears throat> and the, the Netflix people were saying, you know, we shouldn't even give you recommendations. We should know your viewing patterns so well that you should just do the next thing we recommend. Okay. And that by the way, provoked a serious internal debate because they could do that at Netflix, but the whole notion of giving choice or what some of the people say, the illusion of choice. That was a big deal. Then in the final analysis, Netflix wanted you to feel and believe that it was your choice, what you were watching next. 
But if a recommender system, if a recommendation engine really does know you better than you know yourself, we're back to Uncle Norm, the normative answer. That's the best answer. And that is the ideological, teleological, epistemological, ontological, there we go, struggle that exists in recommenders. Best choice versus best choices. That's, that's what it comes down to. And it all depends on what kind of agency do you want to have. And if I may do one last thing and name drop Nobel Prize winning dis, uh, research, Richard Thaler, Daniel Kahneman, Herb Simon, they all talked about choice architectures, nudging. So to a very large extent, innovations in recommendation systems, recommendation engines co-evolve with insights around choice architectures. What should the default be? What should a serendipitous or pushing the envelope, pushing the edge choice be? Is that a function of time of day? When you look for a recommendation for a restaurant or something to eat, should it know that you've had Japanese food the last three days? And so today you want something else or because of how your day is going, you should stick with Japanese food. These used to be hypothetical questions. In fact, these are literally the questions that determine standard of living, quality of life for growing numbers of people all around the world all the time. Well, so I'm, I'm a little confused about, you know, Please. what you're saying. So you're saying that, um, you know, people want to have the ability to override these recommendations or they want to be given, even well, if you know, them. even if you know exactly what they're going to choose, you, you want to give them the, the illusion that that they're going to, um, you know, have some choice in the matter. I mean, that's, that's, that you, you've hit on the thing. Are in the first and final analysis, are people meat puppets whose behaviors and patterns are so predictable that you can say with a 0 0.8, 0 0.9 certainty that they will choose X or the best choice for them is Y or are people predictable just enough so that you can make good recommendations to them and inspire them and empower them to say, you know, now that I see my choices, I realize I now discover in this moment that I would rather do this than that. So you've put your finger on, you know, one of the biggest questions, which is, what does free will mean as people who run recommendation engines come to know you better than you know yourself? Or do they know you better than you know yourself? I would argue that's a testable hypothesis. And that is a hypothesis that is tested literally billions of times a day. And it's also one of the reasons why certain platform companies enjoy market caps of closer to a trillion dollars than a billion dollars. Well, look, I just went to a restaurant, a Japanese restaurant the other night, and, um, I ordered the omakase, right. And, you know, generally when I go to a, um, a decent restaurant and I know I've got a decent chef, um, that's my preference. I, I'd rather just let them, you know, orchestrate the experience for me because I know that they you know, they, they kind of know what they're doing now. Maybe they, they don't know me to the level of the individual so that they can customize it for me. And one of the stories I, I tell, one of the examples I tell in my class is look, when, when you, when your grandparents went to the local market, you know, a hundred years ago, it would be recognized by name and, and the, the merchant would say, oh, well, you know, uh, Mr. Schrag, you know, I think you're really going to like this, et cetera. And then we went through the dark ages where you would just go in and you'd have your scan, your barcodes and person behind the counter would be like, well, you know, have a great day. And now we've moved back to a world where, you know, the, the merchant really does know you as, as an individual, but they, they're able to process like so much more information that they can provide you with like a, a, a bespoke omakase, right? Potentially if they, if they, if they have enough data and they have solid analytics, right? And so, 
So I, I talk about, that's a very optimistic view, right? That's sort of the, the view that if, if we really, if only we really knew everybody, uh, really, really well, then they would just entrust us to orchestrate the experience and tell us, buy this book next, you know, look at this movie next. And, and, and I, I don't know whether that level of perfection is attainable, but I certainly w wouldn't mind it if, if I could, if I really did trust that they knew me, um, as, as well as possible. But you're leaving something out there. I, first, I love how you framed it, but to my mind, you've left something out that's really, really important because the T word is key. You, you trust them to, to, to do that. And trust is key. The issue, and it is one that is discussed in, in, in the book, is that it's not just that you trust them to serve you the best omikaze, you trust them to, not to exploit you to not to serve you something that's the thousand dollar rare abalone or whatever, you know. The, so what does trust mean in this regard? It, am I prepared? And this is one of the fantastic things about trust. If you trust someone or some algorithm, you may be willing to take more of a chance, but something can be to, to, to try something new. But, but if there is doubt, if you don't trust, if you feel that they've come to know you better than you know yourself in order to exploit you with apologies to the principal agent problem, with the, with the ability to, because they know you well, they're going to charge you more. They're going to move you into what their agenda is rather than respecting your agenda. What happens then? And that, by the way, is the other issue. Are we meat puppets? Or are we exploited meat puppets? Do we have agency or do we have agency where we need to be, we need to have recommendation engines to advise us on whether these recommendations are exploiters of us. And these are so critical in design questions. The dumbest thing on the record for attribution that an Amazon could do or a Netflix could do is to come to be seen that it's recommend or Google could do is come to be seen that it's recommendations are for the best interest of the platform, not for the individual user. Now we may not always agree, but if there's a breach of trust there, you know, it's like a best friend who is no longer a friend. You know, it's one thing to take advice from a friend. It's another thing to take advice from somebody you've come to understand is a user. And they're giving you this advice because it's in their best interest, not your best interest, no matter how well they know you. And that's the other aspect I found so fascinating about this, because as our recommenders become better, as they become more knowledgeable, as they come to know us better than we know ourselves, the ethical issues become as interesting as the epistemological issues. You know, what is my best interest? becomes more and more relevant. And how do I know? Becomes more and more relevant over time. Who should I trust giving me advice? My best friend, my, wi my wife, or these algorithms? It used to be a, that used to be a joke question. Who, who would you trust advice for a movie or, or a Netflix series from? Your friends or the algorithm, you know? I have literally been at dinner, dinner, sorry for going on on this, but I've literally been at dinners where, where people said, you really got to see so-and-so and said, yeah, Netflix just recommended that two days ago, you know? So, so you're getting your best advice on restaurants, on travel, on books, on videos from an algorithm, not your friends. What happens to human relationships when your best advice comes from your devices, not your people? So I wonder if you d dig in a little bit to the mechanics of recommendation engines, right? So, you know, when I talk about my class, I talk about kind of, you know, um, uh, unit, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, item-based filtering versus user-based filtering, right. right? So both of these right. are sort of forms of, of collaborative filtering, except that, um, you know, one, one requires that you have some taxonomy of features that you can attribute to the, the, the items themselves, right? Like the, right who directed the movie, who starred in the movie, right? Is it a, is it a horror movie, right? Is it, is it, you know, um, a uh, European movie. And then the other is just, um, you know, understanding users and, and trying to find, you know, users like you, 
Um, right. And then there's these kind of more complicated hybrid models that kind of incorporate both of these things that are a little bit more, more complex. Um, so does the kind of the, the way in which the filter works, does that kind of shape and influence not only the, the strategy of, of data collection, but also the efficacy of, of the, of the model? Do we, do we see, I think the things that people are particularly worried about is this idea of the filter bubble, since all you're doing is looking for, for similarities. The, the idea is that, you know, if you watch a particular type of movie, you're, you're going to be pushed to watching that same type of movie. If you uh, are similar to someone, uh, then those similarities will just get, get reinforced. Um, and so both of these techniques uh, are, are going to stymie serendipity and they're going to stymie um, exploration and, and they're going to kind of stymie the, the, the sort of discovery that people tend to think is more likely in, in, in a world that has more or let's say less efficient recommendation uh, systems. Well, you've packed a lot in there and, I, you know, again, I, there's a lot I agree with, but I just want to peel, peel some of it away on, on, on this. Um, you're, I, I very much agree with, and am concerned about the, you know, the Eli Parser line about the filter bubble, you know, as, as I've gotten older, you know, I believe that the greatest urge and motivation that people have is not sex or money. It's confirmation bias. That's the real, you know, I want, I want affirmation. So I, I am very much concerned about quote unquote, uh, um, similarities that simply reinforce but back to the, the point about patterns. Um, yes, similarity. What are the similarities between a movie, between people like you? What are the, what are the nature of the similarities? And this is where I think we can win and avoid the pitfall that you describe, where, where basically everything degenerates or devolves into a confirma confirmation bias a filter bubble, which is what kind of similarities matter most to us? One of my side hustles is that I'm looking at how can we get people to design recommenders for aspects of themselves? So what's the recommender for the curious Gregory or the influential Gregory or the surprise me? Gregory. So there are aspects of self, I call it selvesware, that I think is very, very interesting. The whole notion of multiple selves is a very, very interesting one to me. And different selves should have different recommenders. But the real question is, what kind of similarity should appeal to us? And this is why you referenced it in passing, but I want to make it a focus. There are hybrid recommenders. So what should the hybrid be of recommendation between people like me and content like this is the weighting 50, 50, 75, 25, 10 to one. Now let me complicate it. And we see Amazon doing this well, but let's say that instead of people like me, I admire you, Greg, I, you know, this conversation. And as I look at the, the, a variety of people that you've interviewed and done podcasts with, it makes me say, you know what, clearly uh, we have, we don't necessarily have common interests, but I find his sensibility of interest. So I want to tune a recommender to have the kind of recommendations that Rick would, would have, by, by the way, we've left out LinkedIn and all of this, which has a great recommend. Who, who else should you connect with in your social net, you know, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So I want the Greg LeBanc recommender button widget waiting in the recommender. So that is the way that I think we're going to not just circumvent, but destroy the issue. Because let's be very blunt here. Let's be very, very blunt here. Addiction goes back to the origins of time. You know, people who become addicted to something or just want to do the same thing over and over again, or want to have a narrow furrow of life. That's, you know, good luck to us, you know, trying to get them out of that. 
But for people whose agency, for people who want, you know, to be exposed to new things, to have different kinds of experiences, the notion of what, what should my similarities portfolio be? Which kind of things are the push the edge similarities, which are the filter bubble similarities. And that, I think, is going to be really, really interesting. I believe the evolution of recommenders is going to be not just coming to know you better than you know yourself, enabling you to discover aspects of yourself that, frankly, you wouldn't have thought about or felt about unless you had done this, met that person, eaten this dish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think recommenders are going to become more and more discovery engines rather than filter bubbles. Now, that may be too optimistic, but you know what? Every now and then I like being optimistic. Well, it doesn't that require a, a new type of customer then, right? Because the reward function that these algorithms use is, uh, you know, is really all about, you, you know, stickiness and, and usage and, and so forth. And so, you know, our stated preferences and our revealed preferences are often very different. So I might say, Hey, I want, um, sure. you know, I, I want, I want, I, I like Bergman or whatever, but you know, Netflix knows that I really like, you know, Adam Sandler or something. And so, you know, they, they it's nice to have these aspirations. I want to work out, but then, you know, I know I'm going to buy the cheeseburger. Right. So, so if the reward function essentially rewards the algorithm for, for predicting what I'm going to do with greater accuracy, then ultimately whatever stated preferences I have or aspirations I have will ultimately kind of, you know, disappear. Um, so, uh, you, 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 just wow, that's, that's kind of pessimistic. I, 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 I beg to differ. Okay. I because in the book, differ. you, you did say that, that kind of, you know, there is this economist, they focus on revealed preferences, not on, on stated preferences. Well, I, I agree, you know, that, that, but the, the, the question, is it absolutely, I, I don't forget, I'm the one who said, you know, addiction goes far back. It, it could well be that people do become addicted to a comfort zone and everything is about that, that comfort zone. And, and let's be very blunt. There will always be people who prefer to stay in their comfort zone. Now, whether that's 20% of the population, 50% of the population, 70% of the population, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I think, and you know, maybe this reflects the kind of people who I run around with, but, you know, I think recommenders and advice, you know, to push, are there boundary pushers? Yeah. And, and this is why, forgive me, I wrote a book, you know, who do you want your customers to become? One of the examples of the dark side of who do you want your customers to become was McDonald's. You know, remember they used to have supersize me. For a very marginal sum of money, they would give you way more food. And it turned out to be one of the most profitable things that McDonald's did because it allowed them to do more inventory turn. It, the, they got greater profitability on this. It was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was a genius marketing packaging innovation. The downside was childhood obesity, obesity, people eating bad food, and ultimately McDonald's discontinued the supersize me, but it was a cliche for, you know, well over a decade. Um, my, my, my point is how can you, who do you want your customers to become? I think if you're an Amazon, I think if you're a Google, yes, I'll go to with China. I think if you're a TikTok or Alibaba, I think if you are um, a Netflix that, that you want to commission new shows to enable new products that really expand the horizons, expand the, the, the boundaries of your best customers and of your typical customers. And now just to give the illusion of continuity, we're right back to the T word that you brought up 20, 25 minutes ago, which is, should we, do we, can we trust an Amazon or a Netflix to broaden and deepen our preferences? revealed preferences, as opposed to feed us the same old shit that they know minimizes the risk of churn for them. Conservatively, that is a multi-trillion dollar question 
over the next decade. One could argue that we're right now just, it's just a, it's just a, a, a moment. Um, we've experienced a shock. We have this new technology and, and the culture hasn't adapted, right? We just, it's like when, right. it, you know, um, alcohol is introduced to a society that has never seen it before, right? You're going to have like this right. century of, you know, alcoholism before they develop some, some, you know, cultural right. mechanisms to, to and resist it. Is, it's a wonderful analogy. Yes. And we can go with the opium wars in China. Absolutely. Sure. Intoxicants. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I mean, when I talk to people, they're like, oh man, I can't believe I just wasted you know all this time on my Facebook. And I'm like, well, I, I don't, I don't seem to waste the time on Facebook. And, and it's because I'm, I'm very, when I see that cat video, I scroll as fast as I can through it to let them know in no uncertain terms that I'm not interested. And then when I see the Bloomberg thing, I click on it. And so as a result, I get more Bloomberg and I get less cat, cat videos. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you're not diligent and you're not, you know, attentive and you're not giving active feedback, then of course you're going to wind up getting the stuff that you, uh, so, so I think, you know, there's trust for, for one thing, but I think it's also personal responsibility. We have to be very careful to limit our drinks, you know, and, and limit our, our, our consumption of, of, of product. Hold and so on, hold on. But you're dealing with two of the, the A's that we talked about. We're talking about agency and addiction. Now, the question that you raise is in the same way that people become quote unquote addicted to Instagram or addicted to TikTok, should that be algorithmically regulated or overseen? Because some people, just like some people become alcoholics and even worse, become alcoholics and drive and kill people driving drunk, there, there are harms. There are, to use a good economic word, externalities associated with that. I think you've put your finger on one of the most important regulatory issues, public policy issues going forward, which is as we discover addictive natures of things that are based on recommendation, we, and we know it's recommendation, we, we can track it, we could audit it. You know, we can, we can see how much time you spend binge watching, you know, or, or scrolling on TikTok or et cetera. At what point does inter intervention be cease to become an option and needs to become required? Should children, people who do not, by the law, have the same amount of agency as an adult, should their exposure or the way their recommender algorithms are cultivated, should that be handled differently? These are huge questions, which, by the way, is why you want to write a book about the bloody topic, you know, because it's about the future of trust. It's about the future of agency. It's about the future of addiction. It's about the future of self-discovery. Now you see why I like this topic so much, but you're raising all of the questions that I feel not only are, are, are important, they can't be avoided because these technologies are not becoming marginalized. They're becoming more and more central to the choices people make. The recommender engine, the recommender systems are the determinants of the choice architectures that the majority of most populations all over the world live by, live with. Now, one of, the stories, one of the stories you told in the book was uh, about YouTube and how they, yeah. um, you know, they, they were trying to maximize, uh, engagement. They created a recommender that, um, got people to, you know, click, click on bait. all these videos, but they, they, right. they were not happy. Right. Um, can you tell that story? The cat video point. Exactly right. Cat videos. Right. But why weren't they happy? They weren't, they were happy because people get click throughs, but they wouldn't spend enough time because like yourself, they forget, I don't want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you suckered me in. You suckered me. You manipulated me and thus betrayed my trust. Now, how does YouTube make most of its money? advertising. How viable is it for an advertising medium to succeed if it is constantly, as if it is seen by its most avid users as manipulating, as exploitive. And so YouTube changed the machine learning algorithm to move from click-through rate, CTR, to dwell time. Because dwell time meant you were engaged, you were listening. That was, that was a better proxy for engagement than being sucked in by a click. Okay. 
So, and that's the balancing act. And most of these organizations, I mean, you, you look at, you know, forgive the technical reference, reinforcement learning, et cetera. You look at these things, they're going to be port recommenders are going to work off portfolios of KPIs around engagement and persuasion and agency. And we're going to be inspecting those KPIs and seeing, are those about exploitation or exploration? Are they, are they serving the best needs of YouTube or the users, the customers of YouTube? Now, this is always going to be negotiated, but I believe that's going to be, to use a phrase that you like, it's a complex adaptive system. There's, it, it's, not, it's not going to hone in or converge on a single answer or a single efficient frontier. I think these are complex adaptive assist, systems and as innovations intrude, as perceptions shift over time, the whole notion of what good advice means also evolves. The notion of what self-discovery means also evolved. I'll go right back to, to your example. There was a time in the 60s and 70s where it was not unusual for people of a certain age, not just to have a drink or two, but to take quote unquote, mind expanding drugs and psychedelics. It's not that they wanted to become quote unquote addicts. They wanted self-discovery from that. And to this day, people are interested in certain kinds of drugs or stimulants to expand their minds. Well, we have the digital counterpart of that. And I think one of the really interesting things going forward is how will digital stimulation and chemical stimulation co-evolve for self-discovery, self-knowledge, et cetera. And no, I'm not an advocate of these things, but that's, you know, you, what, what, what does bioinformatics give us? It gives us a better repertoire of patterns that can be analyzed for certain kinds of therapies and interventions to influence how people perceive, feel, think, taste, smell, et cetera. Yes, well, I like science fiction. So look, if, if I can make better recommendations, the more I know about you, then that means there are these big economies of scale and scope, right? So if. If I'm recommending books, it helps to know what, what movies you like, right? If it I'm yes. recommending movies, it helps to know what music you like. If I want to know, um, you know, what kind of music to recommend, it helps to know like where you are and, and what you're doing. And, and so, you know, the, there's you just. You need for leaving out Spotify. You're, you're, you're correct. Great recommendation engine on that. Sorry for interrupting. Please go right. on. So, so, you know, the more data you have, the, the better you can recommend and the more loyalty you'll get, which means that you'll be able to then presumably get them to provide you with more information, which will lead to better recommendations. So, so with these economies of scale and, and scope, doesn't this tend towards, um, monopolies in different domains, or at least, uh, expansion of these large enterprises into more and more domains? I would believe your hypothesis, which of course is both falsifiable and testable, is a completely legitimate one. It would not shock me at all that Amazon, which does have a music service, um, and there's a there's Alexa and all these things that 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 uh, um, Amazon comes to you and and proposes. In full disclosure: I've done consulting for that. Um, that am, but but not on this that, that Amazon proposes a soundtrack for your life on this as part of the monthly fee, Amazon prime, you know, um, Amazon, you ask Alexa, Alexa, cheer me up. Does Alexa play high energy music or does it play a comedy album, a, a Tom Lehrer song for you, depending upon your, your preference? Do I see, you know, we talked about mood enhancing drugs. That's that. Yeah. Do, do I see that kind of scenario happening within the next 18 to 24 months? You betcha. So is there a desire to, to leverage the economies of scale and scope around data to get greater insight? Yes. And that just makes those issues that we discussed about agency and addiction and trust and exploitation that much more important. Do I believe that there is a natural, quote unquote, natural monopoly in this regard? No, I don't actually, because I believe, I really do believe in Schumpeterian 
creative destruction. But as much as I believe in Schumpeterian creative destruction, I believe in more, even more in individual self-destruction that, you know, it becomes easy to become addicted or it becomes easier to become addicted or to engage in behaviors that lead both in the short term and in the longer term to, to self-harm. So yes, the notion of how we, how we protect ourselves or don't allow our, uh, that, that the bias becomes, how do these technologies amplify our strengths rather than exploit our weaknesses? That becomes a much, much, much more important question. My view is if I had to bet that the most effective therapists and advisors over the next decade are going to be algorithmic machines, mm -hmm. not wise people, you know? Because I believe these are semi-structured problems that have consistent, repeatable, identifiable patterns that lend themselves to what algorithms can do best. That would be my bet. I would, I would absolutely bet that, that therapeutic, uh, 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 what, let's create a phrase, T TREs, therapeutic recommendation engines will be a multi-billion dollar category by 2025. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's, I think that's an intriguing idea. I, I work a lot with financial advisors and it's, ah. it's, it's remarkable how limited the, um, automation is in the world of recommendations. You know, we have these, um, uh, robo advisors, but they're right. extraordinarily primitive. It's like, okay, you're 50 years old. You need like 50% debt, 50% equity. Um, and so you typically would go to a human for something that's a little bit more nuanced, but they're basing their advice on you know, rules of thumb and so forth. So I, I think that that's a huge opportunity right there. So, um, well, financial think, recommendation engines. Yeah. Well, I, we're, we're definitely going to see that. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back and quote you and, and just, here's my bet. My bet is they will be a financial company. Maybe you're advising them and they're going to say, we're prepared to make a bespoke you know, with a visualization, we're going to do a bespoke, um, retirement or spending thing for you. We'd like to look at your last thousand, um, Amazon purchases and your, your Spotify playlists. And based on that data, we're going to get insight into. Oh, and your, your Fitbit data, of course, too, right? Oh, um, shame on me for leaving out the Fitbit yeah. data or Strava <laughs> data. Thank you. Yep. You see, well, that's why you're, you know. Do, your health do, do, records. Do, do, do. Want to get your, EM, your oh, EMR. Well, Got to get your EMR. I want to to be HIPAA compliant. I don't want yeah. to worry about this. But that when, when I get a sense of your acoustic and reading and exercise sort of stuff, then I'm in a much better position to give insight, get, get a sense of your risk tolerance, revealed preference. And, you know, I'm going to come up with portfolio recommendations based on things that I know you like. Ooh. And because we're a, a giant financial services firm, people like you with these kinds of tastes have these kinds of portfolios, which have enjoyed this kind of performance over this period of time. You know what? I think we've just come up with a really good private wealth management approach. What do you think? Uh, absolutely. I've been pushing it for a decade now, but, um, you know, can you tell this great, you have this great quote from Jeff Bezos, right? Um, uh, about, um, you know, why he's not interested in selling, but rather helping provide yes. choices. And I, I have to say that I, you know, I was one of the first customers of Amazon. I've been buying Amazon books since, since day one. And, um, I mean, I'm such a lunatic about it that, um, I'm very reluctant to accept, you know, free copies of books from publishers because it means that Amazon doesn't know what, what I've, what I'm reading. Wow. So I, I'm actually, I'll spend now, money on, wow, on, you sound like it. You I, know bought, I, I bought, I bought your books. books. I, I don't want to undermine my recommender. Now you sound, <laughs> you, you, boy, you sound like you need a fix on, on uh, this. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like pretty, pretty aggressive at making sure that they have full information about my, my reading lists. Um, but, but could you go back and, and tell us that, that quote? Because... Give the interruption. You've just, you've just come up with a brilliant idea for Amazon. 
Amazon should give you an option saying, is there stuff that you've read that we should know about that you didn't buy on Amazon? Oh, no, no. They did that in the early days. They dropped it. They had that. I did. A, I didn't know that. B, maybe they should bring it back. Or maybe people like you. No, then I'd, then I'd stop buying. Then I'd stop buying. <laughs> stop buying from them. <laughs> I'd start taking the free books. You see, I actually believe that you, people like you are their best customers, so it makes more sense for them to ask. In fact, that's this is literally a $100 million experiment. If you buy a certain yeah. amount thing on them, they should ask, is there some sort of thing that you, we, you're doing that we're not aware of that? You know, it's your option. You don't have to tell us. But we'll be able to make a better and more informed recommendation if you tell us. Well, there's an example from my class. I show them a page of my homepage from Amazon from a couple of years back. And the very first book that they recommend is the textbook for my statistics class. And it's there it. and it's, and it, and it was there for, for like weeks. It wouldn't go away. And they, and they were like, we don't understand why this guy is not buying this book. We keep telling him. And it's like, and so I asked my class, say, well, I got eight copies of this book on my shelf. Like, you know, why they recommend it. And so people are like, well, maybe, maybe you're starting a collection. <laughs> it's like, no, I, that's the, the, the publisher sent me those copies because it's a desk copy as an instructor. Um, but Amazon was just perplexed. They just couldn't fit. They were like, this is the perfect book for you. Like, why aren't you buying it? <laughs> right? I, I, I think you should have put them out of their misery and bought it. Used your American <laughs> rest points right? or given it as a gift to somebody, but that's, that we're just winging it here. Right. But, um, but you know, you mentioned that, um, all of these companies that have recommendation engines, these recommendation engines are the product of thousands of experiments that have been done yes. over time. And, you know, this book, The Innovator's Hypothesis, really is all about experimentation, how cheap experiments are worth more than, than good ideas. And yes. you, you ha the first chapter is really a polemic about, uh, you know, ideas. Yeah. And, and it sort of says that good ideas are the enemy of, of productivity, right? And um, for those folks who, like me, who spent years trying to get companies to be more creative and, and generate more ideas. Um, when I finally realized that there were people like me out there doing this and getting companies to start generating ideas, I realized that what we'd done, all we'd done is create idea constipation because these companies now have, you know, more ideas than they can handle. And, right. and so they typically will fall back on the ideas that have the best PowerPoints instead of coming up with a technique for sorting through all the different ideas. And I, and when I read this book in 2014, I realized that the world has come really, really far since this book was published, because now I don't think there are any companies that don't have some kind of active experimentation strategy, right? I, I, I would say of all the books that I've written, that is the one that has become quote unquote accepted anachronistic, the fast, the, the fastest, but I, I want to double down on a point that you made earlier and, and and sort of connected here because, and, and that chapter, you know, where I, it, that polemical chapter, and you're exactly right. Some people didn't just call it a polemic. They called it a screed, an anti-idea screed on, on, on this. Um, it, it's correct. And, and it ties into, let's connect it to the, to the recommender. Um, ideas turn out to be, in my professional opinion, ideas turn out to be the wrong unit of analysis for innovation. That an experiment, and my, my work originally, it was not about experimentation, began around prototypes. How do you build models, model building, you know, right out of science on this. Again, my background is computer science and economics. Um, you know, and, and I migrated from prototypes to experiments. How do we test these things? What kind of, in, instead of trying to quote unquote solve the problem, what kind of insight can we get that will allow us to, you know, accelerate our development process, to iterate faster, because what does digitalization permit? Rapid iteration, ROI, return, not just on investment, but return on iteration. And so I was very, very interested in the notion that, that, the, that coming up with a bunch of good ideas isn't the way to be an innovative organization. It's coming up with a portfolio of experiments. Now, how does this connect back to the recommender book? Because search isn't the right unit of analysis for advice or recommendation. It's, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a better Google is not necessarily the way to, to find that restaurant, find that song, find that movie, find that book. You want 
recommend it. It's, it's the underlying principle is different. It's different. It's like the best choices versus the best answer. So if you were to, to, to look at a, um, a, a coherent organizing principle for me in this regard, it's, I'm trying to always look at what are the true underlying fundamentals that are involved here? And why do those fundamentals interest me so much? Because I, you know, when I was growing up, I loved being the person, oh, that's a good idea. How can you go wrong not having a good idea? But then you realize as you get older, it's frustrating because the good idea just never seemed to go anywhere or even worse. You'd look at it three months, six months later after spending a lot of time and effort and say, gee, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so I'm always looking for what are the fundamentals that matter the most and what are the fundamentals that lend themselves to technological leverage and development and scalability. And you look at things like digital experimentation and recommendation engines and it's like, wow, it, 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 it it's a force multiple. It's not accretive. It's exponential. And that's the kind of disruption. That's the kind of insight. That's the kind of self-discovery that I'm most interested in. Sorry for going off on that, but that's. Well, well look, really it's about the application of the scientific method to business yes. innovation, right? And, Absolutely. um, and to do it in, in a, in a cheap way, right? So you talk about how companies used to, um, when they were trying to investigate an idea that, you know, they used to do an RFP and then they used to set up some very complicated process. And, um, you know, now you can do it much less expensively. Now, is, is this really a product of the technology and the tools that we have available, or is it also in part a change in, in the culture? Does it require a change in what it means to be a manager, right? So it used to be that managers were all about kind of making decisions and then, you know, implementing them or executing them. And now really to be a good manager is to design some kind of, uh, organizational architecture that, that allows those within the organization to, you know, rapidly generate and test ideas. Right. Well, I, 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 I agree with you, but you know, remember, and, and your background is perfect for this because you and I are both old enough to, you know, look back at history at economics and politics and, you, you know, you're a lawyer, you know, the school of law and economics. It used to be there wasn't economics or political science, you know, in the, in the Keynes era, it was political economy, you know, and it's the same. So you, you, we, we, we reductionalized ourselves. So yeah, we were able to analyze economics better, but we lost the, the po political side, political science. You know, they lost the economic side. Uh, um, and I think it's the same sort of thing in organization. As we change the economics of innovation or value creation, what new kinds or different kinds of managerial and leadership skills are required? I grew up in Hyde Park. I'm a Chicago guy. I'm also a University of Chicago guy. I like Coase's work. I like the idea of reduction of transaction costs and coordination costs and collaboration costs. And that's what digital networks do. So we move from R and D research and development to ENS experiment and scale, because what do networks facilitate? They reduce the coordination costs and the transaction costs of scaling experiments into product services and user experiences. We're back to a different kind of fundamentals. But I believe, I strongly, strongly believe that, that economics and technology and culture all co-evolve, you know, and that's why where we used to, we still watch TV, but it's, there's not a network. It's, it's streamed now. We don't change the channel. We didn't grow up with recommenders on our screen, you know? So the whole nature of engagement and interaction has fundamentally changed. And better recommenders reinforce that. But you couldn't have had a recommender. You had, you had critics and reviews in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. So yes, there's a huge cultural disruption here. And it's driven as much by technical innovation and social innovation as it is by, as it is by economics. 
Well, as a, as a Chicago guy, you, you quote George Stigler and Milton Friedman yes. in, in your book, yes. but not in yes. a flattering way, right? Because they both seem to... They were to, wrong. They, that's, that's right. Well, so I was, I was wondering if you could tell the blockbuster story. Will, oh, yeah. Then I'll, 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 I'll vanish. So that is a wonder... Boy, you know, I'm, I'm impressed that you remember that, 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 that story. I'm not, I'm not used to talking with people who actually read the books, you know? Um, so there was a guy, Julian Simon, you know, who was known, he was the anti-limits to growth guy. It's such a very controversial guy, University of uh, uh, Illinois economist, made a fortune mail order stuff. And, you know, he identified a fundamental problem that had happened to him when he was flying and that he was bumped from a flight. He was bumped from flights. Long story short, he said that was ridiculous. Airlines were allowed to oversell flights and they could discriminate. If you arrived later, they had sold it. You, you weren't even guaranteed to get out on the next flight. And so because he was a University of Chicago kind of guy, he liked markets. He came up with the idea of you know, the, the, what, we, what we have now, which is you pay people, to, you create a market. So if somebody wants to take a later flight, you pay them, you give them another ticket. So creating a market in this. And he thought this was a logical thing to do. Remember pre-computer days, it was a logical thing. He tried to sell it to the airlines. Didn't work. He was such a Chicago guy and, 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 and uh, uh, intellectually rigorous that he talked to not one, but two Nobel laureates, George Stiegler at Chicago and Milton Friedman at Chicago saying, what do you think of this idea? Because it makes a market. And both of them, brilliant, brilliant guys dismissed it saying, well, if it was that good of idea, idea, it would have been done already. Nobody even did an experiment that, by the way, they could, not an expensive experiment to do, pick one airport, pick a couple of overbooks, see what people would do. How expensive is it? Wouldn't even do that. And so Alfred Kahn who you may recall, what an economist from Cornell came to be the head of the FAA under, under Jimmy Carter. That was deregulation of the airlines. He said, we shouldn't allow people to be kicked off of flights so cavalierly. And so he was the one who put that, that schema into, and it turned out to be as all good market designs are a win-win for everyone. The people who didn't want to be kicked off, didn't get kicked off. The airlines could book or overbook. They had the market. If it was too expensive to compensate people, they wouldn't oversell as much. So you had a good, healthy feedback loop. So, and if you think about it, it's, it's, it, it really is a, a, a very profitable, scalable network experiments because airlines fly, you know, networks of planes, hubs and spokes of, of, of airlines. I can't put the recommender stuff in there, but it's, it's using markets to divine revealed preference as opposed to stated preference. And by the way, that had a huge, that story, thank you for picking up on it, had a huge impact on me because it underscored again, that it's not enough to have a good idea and it's not enough to have the good idea peer reviewed by Nobel prize winners. Do the damn experiment, test it. You know, that was the thing. That's why Aristotle was wrong. You know, he would observe these things. No, you actually have to do the experiment. What is the hypothesis we seek to test? And so I will close the loop with this. What is a recommendation? A recommendation is a hypothesis about advice you may follow, a song you may like, a movie or video you may want to watch, a restaurant you may want to eat at. It's a hypothesis. You can test that hypothesis. You can see if those recommendations are good or not so good. And so, yes, that is the linkage between, between those two books. So I'm really, am grateful again, not just for this conversation, but for your reminding me and pointing out that, that these things actually have more in common sometimes than I give it credit for. Well, you mentioned this, you, you did some advice for, for Blockbuster and I, I don't think your advice would have if they had followed your advice, it would have, it would have saved the, uh, no. the company. But, but, you know, when I think about what your advice was, it's kind of less important what your advice was. The more important thing was that you advised them to do an experiment yes. and they didn't do that. And that's the advice they, they should have taken, right? Whether the, the idea itself would have turned out to be uh, a good one or not, well, you know, we, we'll never know. We'll, we'll skip. Yeah, it would have been a good idea. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was, a. Uh, so I, I won't go into the details of, of, of that, but they wouldn't do, not only would they not do the experiment, 
they looked at me like I had peed on their carpet. They, you know, they, they had no interest. And by the way, this was also a cheap experiment. You'll, you'll grant because you this was not an expensive, you know, you know, you're asking them to spend a million dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, this is the kind of thing that could be done really, really cheap. Now, the punchline for this is if you were to go, if anybody listening to this podcast or viewing this were to go to the Netflix blog, you would see nothing but posts about all the experiments Netflix is doing on recommendation, on the shows that it's exploring funding, on billing, on all that, that what you have with these network architectures, these platform architectures are ongoing experiments all the time. Amazon is doing literally thousands of experiments a day. So is Netflix. So is Alibaba. So is LinkedIn. All of these platforms have transformed the economics of innovation and experiments have become a marginal cost. Insights you can get from that marginal cost investment can be transformative. And by the way, I'd like to conclude with this. Amazon's recommender engine began under Greg Linden with an experiment that he proposed that was rejected by his boss. But because the culture of Amazon, Jeff Bezos's culture before he went to outer space was let's do experiments. And by the way, there's a good reason for not doing the experiment, but, but they could do the experiment in a cheap way. And, and they, they did it so that the cost, uh, the, the, the value of what they would learn would by definition exceed the cost, the, the risk that they assessed. And that experiment and recommendation became the Amazon recommender system. Greg Linden, it's a wonderful story. It is in the book, but, but yes, recommendation began at Amazon with an experiment that originally was killed. Well, I think there's a big future for recommendation engines. I think that, you know, <laughs> we think of it only, uh, we think of it for the most part as a consumer facing, uh, thing with, you know, Facebook and, uh, Spotify and Amazon, but I think we're starting to see it, uh, infiltrate the workplace, right? Certainly Uber is, uh, at the forefront of that. Um, yep. but also we'll see it on the factory floor. We'll see it with, uh, I know Salesforce does some of this stuff with their, um, idea economy workers. Um, and ultimately, hopefully it'll spread into healthcare and other disciplines. Education, I think is the final frontier <laughs> to get, figure out how to get people to learn more quickly. Uh, and to uh, become wiser over time. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate it. It was a real pleasure, way more wide ranging and way more fun than I was expecting. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Michael Schrage, Recommendation Engines, Innovators Hypothesis, and some other books. Talk again soon. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.